Church, we're so glad you joined us this morning. Just continue to worship with us.
God is good. He has overcome that all the earth, every tribe and tongue, we will sing it out. He has overcome, we will shout it out from the
that and you may be seated. The word tells us that one of the ways that others know that we have Christ living within our heart is a way that we love one another. You know, I'm thankful to God that we have the opportunity, the privilege to be able to live in community with one another and with others and share and spread the love of God with whomever we come in contact with. As a church, we're called to go out into the world and to live exemplary lives that others know that we live a changed life because of who Jesus Christ is. I'm thankful to God that we can live lives, vibrant lives, and we can have the praises of Christ on our lips and live a life that lets others know that we're living what we actually believe and know in our heart. You know, we have the opportunity to live in community and to minister day in and day out. This past week was no different. Uh, Pastor Benji and myself and Andrew Long, our Connections leader, we had the opportunity to be able to minister out in the workplace this week. Last week, God called home a beautiful young 25-year-old girl, Evan Todd, who was an active part of Journey, who volunteered in our Journeytown Family Ministries and ministered to so many kids and families. And, you know, we had the opportunity to partner with Bojangles this week and provide breakfast for those workers and those staff members at the YMCA where Evan worked. And they had suffered and, and experienced tremendous loss, just as we have here at Journey. And so we wanted to reach out and minister and bless them and spend a time of prayer with them and let them know that we care. And we were able to do that because of who we are as a church. Because Journey Church, you make it possible that we're able to reach out and minister. And we do that, one of the ways we do that is through our giving. Just a few moments, our ushers are going to pass the offering basket by you. And you can drop your offering in the basket. And nearby you, somewhere, you'll find a giving envelope. If you'd like a record of that, and we'll provide you a contribution statement at the end of the, month, end of the year, you just fill that information out and drop it in the basket as it drops by. Or if you're worshiping with us online today, you can go to the giving tab and give through that venue. Or um, perhaps you'd like to give at one of our ki giving kiosks out in the concourse, you'll be able to do that right now or directly after the service. But I'm thankful to God that we're able to partner together with one another as the community of believers in this world today. So as we give today, we want you to know that your giving matters. We're able to worship here week in and week out because of us partnering together, pooling our financial resources, and seeing God do through us corporately what none of us could do individually or as one single family. But yet God will take our gifts and He'll multiply and He will bless. And may He bless you for your faithfulness and your willingness to let your life demonstrate where your true treasure is. See, Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. So let's pray together. And Father, as we pray, thank you that we can give that others can know you. Lord, as we give, we know that we're reaching out from these four walls and we're ministering in our community and across the world to let others know that we love you, to let others know that we love them, and for us all to know that we are to live a spiritual life and allow you to flow through our lives to give you honor and glory, reaching people that are far from God and encouraging them to embrace the journey, the vision to live for God, to love people, and to serve the world. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
morning. How are you doing this morning? Hey, look to the person beside you and tell them good morning. Go ahead. Tell somebody good morning. Uh, go ahead and tell the other person on the other side of you, say, you need to go ahead and get ready and control your emojis. Go ahead. Tell them, control your emojis. That's where we've been. Uh, we started a series last week, if you were here. Uh, and we're in week two of it today, and I'm excited about what we're going to be looking at today here in a few uh, moments together. But uh, last week, you know, we talked about the importance of having the right attitude, you know, as far as um, uh, being positive, looking, and ha looking at the things that God has blessed us with. And we're going to kind of extend that into today's message, but really just the way that we view things in our perspective. And we talked about being challenged uh, over this past week not to be negative, right? To not look at things from a, a negative point of view, but to try to encourage instead and looking at Romans 8 and looking for reasons we need to, uh, to be excited, we need to, to, to be encouraged, and we need to be positive. And, and so, uh, like many of you, you know, our family has to work on those things as well and encouraging each other. And of course, you want to practice what you preach. And so, last Sunday night, we were sitting down for dinner, and we looked, and we was talking at the table about today's the message and, you know, uh, getting ready for the week, you know, mapping out everything that's going to go on with all the basketball games and practice and all those things that we have going on as a family and, and try to get an idea of what is going to happen. And then we were sitting there and we was talking about the message and the importance of being positive, the importance of how we see things because what we look for is what we'll find, as we discovered last week. And so we talked about, hey, well, we're, well, let's work on this this week. We're going to hold each other accountable. Brittany speaks up, my wife, and says, hey, I tell you what, me and dad is going to go against Braden and Briggs, you two. We're going to go against you, and what we're going to do is we'll hold each other accountable to say positive things. If we say something negative, we're going to call it out, and we'll, we'll, we'll even keep score. We're going to write down a check every time, you know, you say something negative. We'll write it down, and we'll see whoever has the least amount of checks at the end of the week, you know, we'll get a reward and go pick where we're going to go get ice cream or a dessert or something. We'll, we'll figure something out. So as soon as Brittany said, at the, I'm telling you, we're sitting at the table. She says, me and dad versus Brayden versus you and Briggs. Immediately, Brayden looks and says, Briggs is on my team. We're going to lose. I went, check. And he looked at me like, no, we ain't started yet. And then Brittany goes, Brayden, you're so negative. I went, check. You know, that's. I mean, we started calling each other out, checking, checking. I mean, but we, before you know it, we were quiet at the table just looking at each other. Like, I ain't going to say anything because if I say something, I'm going to get a check. We get home, and the kids are getting ready for bed, and Briggs says, Dad, how many checks I got? And I think he was thinking at it from the positive perspective of it being a check, and Brittany's like, you should have put X's because Briggs thinks checks are good. So he's like, well, what else can I do to get a check? You know, how can I earn another check? And so uh, we had a good time with that this week. But my prayer as we continue through today, we're going to add on to how we view life and talk about the importance of being grateful. Last week I told you, be sure you have your kids here this week, right? Be sure your family's here as we talk about that because in in our culture complaining is almost like a form of art like we can complain about anything I don't know about you but like right now I look and I'm like man I'm just so ready for summertime to be here like you know I want it to be hot so I can wear shorts and flip-flops and man I'm you know want to go to the beach and I'm just ready for that how many of you are ready for the, the the summer to get right go ahead raise your hand all right now those of us that say that about mid-July when we're sweating and we're sick and tired of the the heat we're going man I'm ready for winter to come I'm tired of all this hot I'm tired of all this you know I'm ready to get back in some warmer clothes and put a fire in the fireplace and I'm, I'm just, I'm sick of the heat. It needs to go away. Every season, we can find something to complain about. It's almost as if people have the spiritual gift of complaining. How many of you know somebody with a spiritual gift of complaining? Go ahead, right? We, we all know someone who, who, who has that, you know, in, whether it's too hot or whether it's too cold or, you know, we go to a restaurant and, and we go to a fast food restaurant and if it takes more than five minutes to get our food, we're upset. Like, I, I, just, I need my food. For, forget the fact that they're prepping it and I don't have to wash dishes or clean. I, we're upset because it's taken more than five minutes. We, we can find stuff to complain about. Hey, we turn on the TV and we've got like over 100 channels and we flip it through and we go, man, there's nothing what? Nothing to watch on TV. 
Hey, I can complain about this morning. I can tell you what I complained about. I got up, went in my closet, and normally Brittany will say, hey, but not before. Hey, go ahead and pick out what you want and make sure that it's already ironed and all of that. And uh, We were tired last night, so I didn't do that. So I got up this morning and uh, really early and started going through my closet. I'm going shirt after shirt after shirt, and I'm touching all these shirts. and going, man, I just don't have anything to wear. So y'all know what I'm talking about. In a moment when we can look and, and visually see how blessed we are, but yet somehow often at the same time be so ungrateful for the very thing where we find blessings. And to be very honest with you and transparent, I'm not a very grateful person. It doesn't come natural to me. You can ask my wife. I have to work at it constantly because it's not natural for me to be grateful. I want something better. I want something that's faster. I want something that's bigger. I, I, I want more. What's the next victory? What's the next hill to climb? Always looking ahead. I, I struggle with that. And, and many of us in here, it, it's not a natural thing. Being grateful is not a natural thing. You have to work at it. Look at somebody beside you and say, you have to work at it. Go ahead, tell them. You've got to be willing to, to, to work at it and to pursue a heart of gratitude. Because if we don't work at it and pursue a heart of gratitude, what you will find is you'll live a life with an attitude. And instead of being thankful and having a, a heart of full of gratitude, you'll have an attitude toward things such as entitlement. Things that we deserve. We deserve better. I should get more. So we have to be obsessed with developing a heart because if we're not obsessed with it and constantly thinking about it, we'll forget and we'll go the other direction. And what I've learned is gratitude, when we have a heart of gratitude, it, it helps uh, unlock some other virtues in our life. It helps unlock some other attributes in our life. It helps open up some other things such as when we're more grateful, then we're more thankful. We're more generous. We see life differently. But it's so important to, to understand that. And we have to choose gratitude. We have to make a choice to be thankful. So Luke chapter 17, take just a moment and turn there in your Bibles. Or if you have the Bible app and you're opening up to, uh, there to Luke chapter 17, and of course the verses will be on the screen as well. Uh, back in 2015, I went back and looked, and we actually looked at this passage of Scripture in 2015, and I'm actually going to preach from this text and go into some other things out of this text today, uh, but I was being reminded as I was going back looking at it of one of the things, and I'll share that with you in a moment, uh, that we got from this passage last time we looked at it together. But in Luke chapter 17, I want to read verses 11 through 13 and then stop for a moment. So look on the screen or in your Bible or in your Bible app for just a moment. And the scripture says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus was traveling here. Uh, along the border between Samaria and Galilee. So he's traveling to his next location. And, and look with me, verse 12. It says, as he was going into a village, how many men? Say that with me. How many men? Ten men who had what disease? They had leprosy. Uh, ten men had leprosy met him. And the scripture says that they stood at a distance. They were not allowed to get close to people. They were not allowed to, to, to talk to people, to touch people. They had to stay at a distance, but yet at a distance, they had heard about Jesus. They had heard about the Messiah. They had heard about the miracles. They had heard about his good works. They had heard about all these things, the rumors that were going around. And so yet while they stood at a distance, the scripture says, verse 13, it says, and called out with a loud voice, meaning they were distant, but they wanted Jesus to hear them. And they called out to him, and they called him Jesus, and they called him Master. They said, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus, would you hear our cry? Jesus, would you just listen to my pain? Would you understand what I'm going through? Jesus, would you take a moment and notice me because nobody else will? Jesus, would you have pity on us? How many times have we prayed that prayer? Jesus, would you just hear me? Jesus, would you understand the pain that I'm going through right now? Jesus, would you just show up in a miraculous way and heal this person? Or Jesus, would you do something and help me spiritually in my drought? Jesus, would you have pity on me? Would you forgive me for the stupid mistakes I made last weekend and the results that's going to come now because of it? Would you have pity? 
You can write this down. We won't turn there, but you can write this in your notes. Leviticus chapter 13, Old Testament, actually talks about this disease, leprosy. You can go back and read that chapter and learn a lot about this disease. But with this disease, we know that they had to wear torn clothes. They had to cover their face, keep their mouth closed to not spread the disease. They had to stay at a distance. They had to yell out, unclean, if someone was to come near them to identify themselves as one who had leprosy. So they would yell out, unclean, unclean, letting people know, hey, stay away from me. Don't come over here. It would eat their flesh away. It was a disease that would cause their sores to ooze. A terrible disease. A disease that it caused in which many of them, when they would go to sleep at night, perhaps when they would wake up, they may be missing a finger where the rats would to eat on their flesh. Terrible disease. You can imagine the last time they've had any kind of intimacy with embracing someone or hugging someone or someone there to hold them or someone there to comfort them or someone there to talk to them, whether it was their spouse or whether it was their kids or whether it was their mom or their dad or their family. They had to be exiled. They had to stay out in a distance away from everyone else. You can imagine their pain in this moment when they're calling out to Jesus saying, yelling it, would you have pity on us? Verse 14. When he saw them, Jesus noticed them. Look to somebody beside you and say, Jesus Jesus notices you. Go ahead, tell them, Jesus notices you. When he saw them, he said this, Go show yourselves to the priest. And they went, and the scripture says that they were cleansed, meaning they were healed. Their life was changed. It was different now. Verse 15. Say those first three words with me together. One of them. Not two of them, three of them, four of them, not ten of them. How many were there? Ten. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he was cleansed, his life was changed. Only one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back. And here's what the scripture says. That he was praising God in a loud voice. He had a heart of gratitude and was praising God in a loud voice, letting it be known that his life was changed. Verse 16, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. In verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? And Jesus knew. He was saying, hey, all ten were healed. Only one showed up to thank him. He says, were not all ten cleansed? He goes on, he says, where are the other nine? Where are they at? Verse 18, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner, the Samaritan? Has no one else come to thank me for what I have provided them? Now, you can picture this. This is life change. This is, I can go back in the city and see my family again. I can actually have a conversation one-on-one with my friends. I can actually embrace someone in a hug now. My life can go back to being somewhat normal like everyone else. My life has changed. I'm having a second chance at life. Big change. And how many showed up to thank him? One. Only one showed up. So the question that I want you to write down in your notes is, to ask ourselves the question, how can I be that one? And that's where we'll be today. How can I be the one that shows back up? How can I be the one that's thankful? How can I be the one that lives a life of gratitude? How can I be the one that is reminded daily of all that God has done for me? And so I'm going to give you some statements that help you choose gratitude every day. Because in our flesh, it doesn't come naturally. We often go the other direction. And so if you're taking notes, I want you to to write these statements down, and there'll be three of them today. The first one is this. You must be reminded that everything we have that is good comes from who? Let's say it together. Everything we have that is good comes from God. It comes from God. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 17, the scripture says that very thing, that every good and perfect gift is from above. 
that, that it comes from God, that, that God is the one that provides that. Anything good that you have today, anything good that you have right now, whether you realize it or not, comes from God. You, you may say, well, and, and I've had people say this before, well, I've worked for it. You know, I, I, I went to school. I, I had to study and pass those tests. I worked for it. I, I earned this. I earned this degree, you know, I, I earned this job, I earned, you know, this checking account and what I have, I, I, I earned this opportunity to have uh, these possessions and, and the vehicle and the home or the things I have, I earned it, I'm the one who pays the check, I'm the one who shows up for work, I'm the one who does all of these things, I'm the one who's provided for my family and my kids to be able to, to have an education and to have food on the table, I'm the one that provides those things because I work really hard. And that's good. God calls us to work hard. But even in that, we must be reminded that ultimately God's the one who provides. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God is the giver of good things. Just think about this for a moment. Who built the ark? Noah. Who gave Noah the plans? God. Who provided Noah with the ability to build? To save his family. It's God. God's the one who gave the Israelites bread to provide food for them. To direct them with, you know, have the fire by night. God's the one who provided. God's the one who gave David a stone in order to kill Goliath. It was God. God's the one who, who showed up at, with a whale for, for Jonah. And to swallow him and take him and take him and, and spit him back out. God, God's the one who provided those things on the shore. God's the one. God's the one who gave Mary the faith to obey and give birth to Jesus. It was God. He gave the wise men a star to be able to follow, to find Jesus. John 3, 16, God gave the world what? The Son of God. God gave Jesus, right? The Prince of Peace, our Savior. What does God give us? He, he, listen, He gives us a peace that's above all understanding. He gives us the Holy Spirit who who convicts us, who encourages us and strengthens us, who guides us with the Word of God that He's given us. He gives us help to bless us. He's given us our, our friends to be able to and enjoy and that love you and, and the life that you have. It, it all comes from God. God is completely good. God is constantly good. God is unchangeably. He, he doesn't change. He's the same. God will uh, never not be good. He'll never be less than good. Everything that God does is good. Now you say, why are you overemphasizing that, that God is good, that God provides good? Because here's the reason. When you embrace the fact that God is good and that he provides good, everything good and perfect for us, and then we realize that everything is a gift from God, it changes our attitude. It changes the way that we see things. Instead of an attitude of entitlement, well, I deserve this, is an attitude of gratitude that we're thankful for what we have. We find that in Luke 17 with those that felt entitled to it. They felt entitled that it was God's job to heal them, that it was his responsibility to change their life. They've been like that long enough, and they deserve to, to have another chance. And as a result, they... So they were looking at it from entitlement instead of gratitude. Only one showed back up. And what happens is when we view it from the, the point that God's the one who gives everything that's good and perfect, we embrace an attitude of gratitude which overflows into other positive attributes in our life. It, it changes other things in the way that we see it. And so it's important to realize that everything we have that's good comes from God. Don't forget that. Number two, write this down, and, and this one's big. This is one I struggle with, by the way. And so my wife would even tell you today that, that I need to preach this to myself constantly. And I know if I struggle with it, there's probably many of you that struggle with it too. So write it down. It's this. I will not let what I have be overlooked by what I want. Write that down. I will not let what I have be overlooked by what I want. Ecclesiastes chapter um, 6 and verse 9. 
there's a passage there that says, better what the eye sees than the roving of an appetite. Meaning this, it's better to look around and see what you have and be thankful for it than to have an appetite for things that you do not have. Because when you begin to look at your appetite for things that you do not have, you will overlook what God has already blessed you with. And you will miss it completely. And what gratitude does is it turns what we do have into enough. When we're thankful for what we have, we realize we have enough. And it's important to understand what that means, and I don't have time to go into that today. We've actually looked at that before, the difference between being content and complacent. You know, we should all be content with where, what God has given us, but now we, we shouldn't remain complacent. We should move forward and, and continue to work as God gives us the wisdom and direction and vision. But in the meantime, we need to be thankful and content with where we are. And, and be mindful of that, because what happens for me is when I begin to look ahead, when I look at other things, when, when I look at the next hill to climb or the next thing to go after, whatever it is, I'm very quickly to, to forget about what's in front of me or what's with me because I'm looking too far ahead. And as a result, I'll begin to overlook things that are going on right now because I'm focused on where I want to be. It's a very dangerous place to live. If, as a parent, you'll miss out on things with your kids if you always stay too far ahead looking and you'll miss out on things in life that are going on right now with your kids. So important to not overlook where you are and to be thankful for where you are and, and to allow God to work in and through those things. Because the truth is, you know, God continues to provide for us on a daily basis. Many of us, when we leave here today, you don't have to think much about where you're going next. You're going where? To what? To eat, right? Most of us in here are blessed to be able to eat three meals a day. Some of you are going three. I eat like five meals a day. What are you talking about? But we're blessed to be able to do that. Where we look in other countries, underdeveloped countries, where people may get one meal a day. To be mindful of where we are and what God has provided for us. The, the jobs that we have. The, the bed that we have to sleep on tonight the clothes that we have to wear, the health that we have, the, the car that does get us to work or around to get the groceries, that we have the capability of worshiping freely right here where we are today. To not forget about where we are just because we're looking far ahead because I know that I fail at this miserably if, if, if I get so focused on it and my wife has to reel me back in and say, hey, don't forget about where we are right now. Your kids are right here. We're, we're right here. Don't forget to celebrate this. Don't get caught up in what's ahead and you miss out on what's now. So don't lose sight of that as parents and, and as in any aspect of your life. And I think Paul had it figured out. Philippians chapter 4, verse uh, 11. Here's what he says. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. But he's want to give a teaching moment here, and he says, For I have what? You, you may even want to underline this word in your Bible or highlight it to have it. But he says, I have what? Learned. In other words, this is not something that's natural. Learned means there's a discipline there. Learned means we have to work at it. Learned means it's a process of time. It's not natural to be, have an attitude of, of being thankful or, or showing gratitude. Right? As our kids, uh, it's, it's different than sin. Sin, you don't have to learn. Our, our kids learn how to sin on their own. It's in their flesh. But this, he says, for I have learned. And he's going to say that twice. We'll see it here. For I have learned to be in content. There's that word. Learn to be content whatever the circumstances. So there's nothing wrong with being in different places in life. I think we go through seasons. But it's how we respond to those seasons. He says, I've learned to be content with whatever the circumstance. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. Or verse 13, I'm sorry, where's the verse 13? Or verse 12, this is it. For I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He says, I've been on both, in both places. I have learned the secret. There it is again. I have learned, there's that word, the secret of being content in any and every situation. Good or bad, he says, you know, for the, for the positive and for the things that go wrong in my life, 
you know, where I'm in need or I need help. And either way, I, I've learned to be content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Nothing wrong with having plenty, nothing wrong with being well-fed. But there's seasons that we go through in those different places. And he says, regardless of the situation, I've learned to be content. There again, it's, it's something that you have to work at. Look to somebody beside you and say, you got to work at it. Go ahead, tell them. you got to work at it. Verse 13. We all know this verse. I can do all this. Now he's referring to everything we just read about. When I'm in need. When I'm poor. When I need help. When I'm well fed. When things are going well. In, in all of those areas. I can do all of this. Meaning he can be content. He can show gratitude. But it's through him, through Christ, who gives me the strength to be able to do it. That God gives us the strength to be able to live that life. That God gives us the strength to be content with where we are. To be reminded of the blessings that we have. To be thankful. And live a life of gratitude. And so when we look ahead, nothing wrong with having vision and looking ahead. But don't get caught up in looking ahead that you miss what's right in front of you. Don't miss out on the blessings that he's got around you already. So be reminded that everything that comes from God, every good thing comes from God. And then also be reminded of those things around you that you may be not paying attention to, the blessings that you already have because you're looking for something else. And then the last one is this. And we were just singing about that a moment ago with his praise being on our lips. I will give praise for every blessing I receive. This is important. Write that down. Important statement. I will give praise for every blessing that I see. Why is this so important? And we can all testify to what I'm about to say. Because every blessing that is not praised turns into pride. Every blessing that God gives you, if you do not praise him for it, it turns to pride. It turns to, I deserved it. It turns into, I worked hard for it. It turns into, this is mine. This is my blessing. It, it, it turns into a, a, a self-centered focus. I will give praise for every blessing I receive because if you do not give praise for the blessings that you receive, those blessings will turn into pride. Psalms verse, uh, chapter 63, uh, verse 4 um, and 5. Um, you can read, it says this. He says, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Look to somebody beside you and say, it's okay to lift your hands. Go ahead, tell them. It's okay to lift your hands. I will praise you as long as I live. This is a life of gratitude. For all of my blessings, I'm going to praise you, right? As long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands, which is an act of surrender. Verse 5. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. Meaning I'm going to be satisfied and I'm okay, I'm content. I will praise you and I'm content and I'm satisfied with, as, with the richest of foods, with singing lip. With, sing, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Your praise will ever be on my lips. That I will praise you because I'm satisfied with what I have. I'm content with where I'm at. As I look at my family, I'm content. As you look at your place where you're at, the job you have, the things you have, that, that you're content, and that you're thankful, that you give praise and not let it turn into pride and allow it to change your perspective. Just a couple of years ago, we were uh, down in Orlando, and we were, our family was down there for a couple of days on um, vacation, and we were going into this restaurant to, to eat, and our oldest child, Braden, somehow went missing, and he disappeared. And I'm telling you, we looked all over the restaurant we looked outside we were going around you know we, we were, there's a lake out there we were looking around you know where people were going by and I mean the, your worst fears they're thinking somebody has grabbed our kid and we looked and we looked and we looked and I mean frantically you know panicking like where, where's he at and I mean we looked everywhere and come to find out he was in a, a store around the corner 
looking at the toys. Taking his time, just checking everything out, not even thinking that he was missing from us. I mean, and for those few moments, what was only a few moments felt like hours of just panic. In just the moment, that panic turned to praise. Why? Because we were thankful that he's still with us. We were thankful that we could see him again. It reminded us of the blessings that we have in our kids. Where sometimes, you know, you, you just want to wanna take them out back, you know what I'm talking about, when they're not listening. You're like, man, we're going to straighten this out. And then, then you turn around, though, and in a moment you're rejoicing because they're okay. It's being reminded of the blessings that God has already given us. Take just a moment, and I want to help you with this. Take just a moment, and I want to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. I, I, I want to help you be able to visualize this and understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about. With your eyes closed, here's what I want you to do. I want you to visualize someone that you love. If you're a student in here, I want you to visualize your parents for just a moment. If you're parents, I want you to visualize your kids, maybe your spouse, your loved ones. Now, I want you to visualize for just a moment with your eyes closed, if you were to walk out of here today and something tragic has happened, and you'll never see them again. Just for a moment. Never have another conversation. And on this side of eternity, never, never see them again here on earth. The hurt, the pain, Now look at, look at me for just a moment. Thankfully and hopefully, that person that you're thinking about is still here. But it changes the perspective when we begin to see things the way that God wants us to see them. We get so caught up in everything else we want or we want to see or, or make happen, and we forget about the blessings that's right in front of us. As Pastor Ronnie said earlier, just this past week we had someone who's a faithful um, follower of Jesus who served here at Journey. In fact, uh, she still checked in on Planning Center and was supposed to serve next weekend here at Journey. Wasn't feeling very well uh, last Wednesday. Last week, she didn't feel very well. Was feeling like she was getting sick. And over the weekend, went, went with her family and went home and went to sleep and didn't wake up. 25 years old. No more conversations. No more seeing her, you know, here serving with our kids. We was explaining that to our kids this weekend. Look, look at the people around you. Look at someone and say, you're not promised another day. And then tell them this, you need to be thankful for what you have. We need to be thankful for where we are and what we have. Um, over the weekend, uh, we went and visited John and Alex from Houston who serve here, and they may actually be watching right now. He was telling me they were going to be watching from the hospital room. Um, but they've been in the hospital for 11 days now uh, with their child, Matthew, who's, who's been very sick with RSVs, had a breathing machine uh, working to help him breathe, and it's been a very difficult time for them. And went in yesterday, and you know, the whole time I was there, I never heard, man, we're just sick of being here. It's been so long. We're ready to get out of here. You know, we're just, we're just tired of this place. Never heard that at all. Here's what I heard. I walked in, and they said, man, we're so thankful that doctors have the ability and the technology to be able to provide for our child, to be able to take care of him. We're so thankful that we got here in time to be able to have that. So thankful that, that we're here, and they're looking out after him to, to help him recover that we can get back home. So thankful that, that, that God's providing Having an attitude of what? Gratitude. Not looking ahead and forgetting what's around us and also being willing to give praise for every blessing and not allow it to turn into pride. In closing, in Psalms 103, verses 2 uh, through 5, here's what Scripture says. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all of his what? Benefits. So I don't want to forget. I want to have a, a, a mindset of being thankful and showing gratitude that I will not forget his benefits. What are his benefits? Look with me. Verse 3. Who forgives all of your sins, not some of them, but every 
bad choice you've made, every sin that you've committed, who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. Verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit. What were those guys saying? Have pity on us, Master, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Verse 5, who satisfies, being content, being satisfied, who satisfies your desires with what kind of things? We've already talked about it. Good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. May we not forget the benefits that God has provided for us, starting with salvation, starting with bringing us out of the pit, starting with, with life change, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe some of you are in the pit this morning and you're looking to be brought out. You're looking to be rescued and you feel like you're in bondage to your sin and you feel like you're in bondage to this life and you feel like there's no way out. And you know it's a decision you need to make and surrender in your life to Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity with no one looking around. If you would say, hey, Pastor Benji, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to repent of my sins. It starts right here. My gratitude starts with the fact that I'm going to be thinking and praising Jesus for what he's about to do. The blessing that I'm about to receive that my life's going to be changed and eternity is going to be set. No one looking around. If that's you right now on the count of three, if you say, Pastor Benji, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to do it right now. I can't wait any longer. God's been after me. The Holy Spirit's been working in my life, and I know it's a decision I need to make, and I'm tired of running from it. Right now, one, two, three. No one's looking around. Just simply raise your hand and say, that's me. Thank you for raising your hands. In the back, I see you. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hands. In the left over here, sir, I see you. On the right, thank you. I see your, I see your hand as well. Thank you. God bless. In the middle, thank you. I see your hand. Thank you, sir. God bless. Thank you. Hands everywhere. I want to pray for you, and we're going to celebrate in just a moment. But before I pray, I want to ask, is, is there others of us in here that's willing to say, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, but, but I've got complaining down to an art. I've got where I'm, I've, I've got a mindset of being entitled and not a mindset of showing gratitude and I've been looking out at other things that I wish I had and as a result I'm missing out on what God's already blessed me with and I need to regroup and I need to refocus on those blessings and give praise for them so they don't turn to pride if that's you and God's convicted you of that this morning would you just lift your hands with me and pray Father, I pray right now over this house. I pray over those that are watching online, God. I, I pray for those that, that are believers, but, Lord, they've been struggling with, with having a life of gratitude. And, God, that we would be reminded of our blessings in you, Father, that we'd be reminded of what you've done, that we'd be reminded that everything that comes from you, God, is good, that you are for us, that you are not against us, God, but you're with us, that we'd be reminded of that, that you've given us these abilities. That God, that we would be faithful in using them as we continue to work. And as we work and look ahead and have vision, Lord, help us not to miss out on what's already around us and what you've already provided for us, that we celebrate that and we thank you for that. And in these blessings, God, that we praise you with our lips, we praise you with our mouths, we praise you with lifting of our hands, we praise you with the life that you've given us. Help us to praise you so it doesn't, it doesn't turn into pride. God, we rejoice and we thank you right now for the salvations that have happened. Hands everywhere. People are praying, repenting of their sins, confessing you as Lord. Life change is happening. Lord, help us not to take your movement of what's happening for granted, God. We celebrate that. We give you the glory. People are going to walk out of here changed, and they're different than they walked in. And we celebrate together with that, God, and we thank you. May those praise be on our lips as we leave here today, as we rejoice. May we have an attitude of gratitude. Father, may we be the one. May we be faithful. May we be grateful. And thank you for all that you've done and are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And as we stand up, as we do every week.
because life change happens every week around here. It's not something that's new, but it continues to happen. Let's let them know how excited we are for them. Come on.
Amen. Amen. You can be seated. There's such a freedom in this place, and we rejoice with each and every one of you that have made a decision to follow Christ this morning. It's the best decision you'll ever make, and it's also the most important that you will make. And we are standing by your side because there's freedom in the house, and you experience, in the presence of God, you experience that freedom. And what better joy to know that we are saved and that we have Christ living in us. Amen? Amen. Seated next to you there in your seat, you'll see a connect card. And the next decision that we need you to make is to help us to know that you've made that decision. If you've made a spiritual decision this morning, we want you to take just a moment and fill this card out. Because it is, like I said, one of the most important decisions that you'll make. And in that, we want you to know that you're not alone. That you don't have to walk this journey by yourself. That you have a church, that you have a people that is that is standing willing to stand beside you and to walk with you on the journey called life. So take a moment and fill that out. And also, we were just, I was just told, we're, we're also an announcement to make that we're doing baptism next Sunday morning. So if you made a spiritual decision, what better time than now than to go public with your profession of faith and to be baptized. So you can actually mark that on your card as well. If you'll sign up for baptism, if you've been waiting and wanting to as well, take a moment, fill out this card, and put, I would like to be baptized. There's a little section right there you can just check. You'll be contacted this week because we've got a, already a few lined up for next week, so it's going to be a great day in the house next week. But also, if this is your first time, we just want to say thank you so much for choosing Journey. We have a free gift for you. If you'll just take this card, fill it out, and go see our, our pastor out at the Connection Center, we'd be glad to give you that free gift. We just want a record of your attendance. We're not going to bug you or send you all kinds of email or anything like that. We just want to know that you are here and that we can partner with you in any step of life that you're at. But we're thrilled that each and every one of you here, thank you so much for being here this morning. What a freedom in this house. I don't know if you sense the freedom that's in this house, but I sense the freedom that is in this house, that God has done great things. Amen? So go in God. Live, love, and serve for Jesus this week, and we'll see you back next week. God bless you.